For tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Family summer camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Sunday afternoon, June 22, 1980. Maxwell White, speaking on restoration, is a teacher of the afternoon. Satan is very real. And those who try to say that his power is gone, yes, it's broken. Jesus broke it at Calvary. It's broken. But we have to put it into effect. We have to put it into effect. And we don't know. We don't know our right. But we're learning. And as we learn, Satan's going to get a blacker and blacker eye and we're going to keep putting him underfoot until we bind him up and present him bound unto Jesus. Amen. And all is for him. We're working at it. We've got a long way to go. But we're not going to give up because we're going to be victor. And I'll turn the remainder, remainder of the service to Brother Maxwell White to minister the word of the Lord and... Now, I'm again uh, purposely laying a bit of groundwork uh, this afternoon on restoration because I want people to understand this. And our brother very admirably told you this morning that God is not looking for people who are looking only for the gifts of the Spirit, including healing and deliverance. He is looking for people who's looking for Jesus. Amen. And when you've got the giver, you've got the gift. But if you're looking for the gift without the giver, you may not get very much. And that's why I'm trying to lay this foundation. And then in the series of talks that I'll give while I'm with you, <clears throat> I am going to hold a deliverance service, a mass deliverance service, or mass as far as the people are concerned. Maybe a couple. There will be two, will there? Right. Well, I'll hold one anyway. And I've held deliverance that mass deliverance services of hundreds of people uh, in the United States and in South Africa and uh, it's incredible I was reading very briefly a little bit about uh, what happened when Wynne Wally was here how he rebuked this uh, spirit of mockery and how this man was in the meeting with a, a, a mocking spirit and yet he got delivered isn't the mercy of God wonderful and yet if the knowledge of deliverance had not been given to us today that man might have gone to hell it's just as serious as that there are people in our churches, and probably here, I am a conservative preacher, a very, very clear, distinct preacher, but conservative. There are probably people who sitting in the chairs today who need deliverance and don't know it. It's incredible, isn't it? You can need deliverance and don't know it. And it's only as the Spirit of God suddenly begins to speak that you say, well, I'm going to submit myself to this prayer. There's a, a beautiful young lady here today who's graduating from Oral Roberts University and she shared with me at lunchtime today that she picked up my book on the power of the blood and she said she only got through about two pages and she couldn't read anymore because the demons in her simply began to choke off this and they wouldn't have it uh, until she was prayed for, I think by Derek Prince later and received her deliverance. Now there is a, a young lady at school or Roberts University and yet she needed deliverance and how many people today need deliverance we don't know but what we do know is the whole tempo is quickening you know in John Wesley's day they used to fall to the ground in his services and of course you're not told this theologically but experientially this is what happened the demons came out of the people and after 20 minutes they'd rise up and start praising God many of them got filled, filled with the spirit and they were saved and filled with the Spirit and delivered all in one meeting just when, when, when John Wesley was preaching. And that was 400 years ago. And now what he had is coming back plus today in the final great experience of the church being cleaned up, ready for the coming of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So a little more <coughs> preparation groundwork. We're going into the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi. <coughs> and several people have thanked me for making it all so clear and that uh, I seem to be making the Bible make a bit of sense whereas a lot of people have made it a lot of confusion 
And now, <clears throat> we learn we learn by the contrast. In physics, all physics, all material is made up of positive and negative. The very chair you're sitting on is made up of positive and negative. Everything is positive and negative, day and night, winter and summer, and truth and error, God and Satan. And so we often learn about the power of Jesus by learning about the power of Satan. In fact, the power of Satan and sin and sickness drives us to Jesus and his power for deliverance. And we wouldn't have known about his power if we hadn't have experienced the devil's power, right? This is absolutely true. I first learned about the supernatural uh, as a young boy, uh, ten years of age, because my mother, on my mother's family, she had a large family, all her family were engaged in the occult. And so the first thing I ever learned in my life as a young Presbyterian boy was the power of Satan. That's the first thing I ever learned. I saw tables walk up walls. I saw Ouija boards operate. I saw levitation take place. And I accepted that as the supernatural, that the departed dead people were manifesting themselves, and that was a kind of a normal thing as a young Presbyterian. <laughs> now, what do you make of that, eh? Seeing a table walk up, and that's God. See? Seeing suddenly a person take off and go out into the air, that's God. See? Well, I mean, I saw those things, so when, of course, I came into the knowledge uh, of the baptism of the Spirit and the uh, uh, speaking in tongues and, and prophecy and the healing the sick, they didn't know about casting out demons in those days. And he said, that's it, that's it. I've seen the wrong, now I've seen the right. I had a contrast. I had a contrast. And so we're going into the contrast now. The first verse of the chapter 4 of Malachi is a chapter that many, many of the doom, brook, doom, gloom and boom preachers are preaching on today. And as we saw yesterday, there are lots of doom, bloom, and... No, not bloom. Doom, boom, and... Right, bloom. <laughs> scriptures that you can preach on if you want. But the point is they don't apply to us. Do you understand? They are there, but they don't apply to us. God is merely telling us what he's going to do with the godless nation. When my people, when my judgments are in the earth, then will my people learn righteousness. And so you can't learn righteousness without the judgment being there. <clears throat> and when you learn righteousness, you say, aha, that's what I would have been judged with. <clears throat> but praise God, now that I'm seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, praise God, I'm in a different classification. I'm in the blessing group, not the cursing group. God covers them both. Now let's see the cursing group. God start, he does this, you follow the scriptures very carefully and you'll find it. So many times, especially in the psalm, contrast, contrast, work of Satan, then the work of God. Here's the work of Satan, or the judgments of God using Satan. <clears throat> oh, what a sort of earth. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Wow, wow. He says, is that going to happen over here? No. <clears throat> you know, I just mentioned this. When I preach, so many thoughts come into my mind that I could preach all night. There is one group of nations in the world that are up for judgment. One group of nations that is up for judgment. You know who they are? the Russian Confederacy. That's the only group in the Bible that God said he will wipe out. Now, who are those? What's the Russian Confederacy? The Union of the Soviet Republics, <coughs> led by Russia, or Rosh. She controls Ethiopia. That's still on the map. She controls Libya. That's still on the map. And they're both communist nations. She controls Iran. You've heard about that. She controls Iraq, which is part of the old Persian Empire. She controls Kagama, Turkey. And there's one more, Goma. I'm not quite certain who Goma is. Some people have suggested it's East Germany, but I would not like to say positively. It may be, it may not be, I don't know. But it's some nation there in the East. And this confederacy of nations say to themselves, we are going down to destroy Israel in the Holy Land. And that will be our last thrust. God says, yes, it'll be your last trust. Come along, I'll help you. He puts hooks in their jaws. He brings them down to the Caucasus, and over the Caucasus mountains, the cloud to cover the land. 
In the invasion of Czechoslovakia a few years ago, the Russians' first experiment was to bring in tanks and big guns and aircraft. And they came down in Bratislava Airport and Prague Airport, and they brought these tanks and guns in aeroplanes as a cloud to cover the land. And then they, uh, they, they took their guns and they took their tanks out and they took control of Czechoslovakia. That was a little showpiece, the way they're going to try and do it. But in order to get their tanks and guns, they can't fly into Jerusalem because it's covered by mountains. And so they fly into the fertile plain, as you call it, fertile, like turtle, the fertile plain of uh, Megiddo or Armageddon. And I bust right across that whole stretch of land and seen it. Now, when they land down, the easiest place for them to land their huge flotilla when attacking, to, to attack the Holy Land, is to get all their tanks and all their guns and all their men and all their armaments out on the flat plains of Armageddon, which is 35 miles north of Jerusalem. And then an evil thought will come into their minds. They say, now we'll go down against the unwalled villages of Israel. But they never move. That's when the boom, doom, and gloom part comes in. And it takes seven months to bury the dead. And as we saw yesterday from Joel, he drives their armies back to the Arctic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and destroys them without root or branch. Now, have you got that? That's not you, is it? Well, I'll give you this right now. I was sharing it with some people at lunchtime, and it was well received, and we got no objections, nobody punched me on the nose, so I'm out just as well to <coughs> tell you right now. Brother Miller believes anyhow, and he invited me, so blame him. Do you know that in the book of Revelation, the United States of America is mentioned? How many know that? Oh, good. Well, praise God. I'm so glad to hear that, because it makes all the difference. If you know this, you are not going to be frightened about boom and gloom and doom. Now let me take you into the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. There are other references which I think are fairly clear, but this is one of the most amazing to me. The 12th chapter of the book of Revelation deals with the woman, the dragon, <coughs> the man-child, and so on. Now the woman in of the Bible, and remember the book of Revelation, is a book of symbols. It's a signified book, a book of signs and symbols. You cannot literally say, say for instance, that the two witnesses are two men. You can't do that. And you can't say that the beast is an animal. You just can't do that kind of thing because these are symbols and you have to understand what the symbol symbolizes or signifies. Do you understand the principle? There's a principle here. Don't guess at the book of Revelation because you'll get nowhere. Now the woman in symbol always means God's people. Under the Old Covenant, it means the 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of them whom God divorced, so they're not the woman here, because we're now into the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation is the end of the Bible. This is the church. This is the church. God's bride. Okay. Now, it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, 12 apostles of the Lamb, under the New Covenant. Then she meets the great red dragon. Well, you know who he is, so we won't go into all that. But we will go into... Uh, <clears throat> we will go into verse 6. And the woman, the church... Let me just equate this word here. The woman, the church, fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, don't, don't go into that now. I went into that with a friend at lunchtime. Verse 14. And the woman, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, which is 1260, on the face of the serpent or the devil. Now, during the dark ages, we were bringing out the scripture today, the, the first Pontifex Maxima was enthroned in 6, 110 A.D. His name was Pope Innocent III. What a name to give a guy like that. And then, from his time onwards, for 1260 years, a prophecy, a day for a year, the same as in the book of Daniel. 610 B.C., 1260 years on, gets us to the year 1870. 1870. And don't ever ask a Roman Catholic what happened in 1870, because no one will ever have taught him. In 1870, Garibaldi, the hero of modern Italy, attacked the Vatican, 
kept, uh, took the four papal states back from the Pope, took the Pope personally and locked him in a common Roman jail, stripped him of every penny that he got in the Vatican and founded the modern kingdom of Italy under King Victoria Emmanuel. That was the beginning of the end of the supreme power of this power that had ruled for 1260 years and during this period of time no less than 50 million Christians were put to death. But there was always a residue. Some of them hid in the Alps, some of them hid in the Carpathian Mountains, some of them hid in Ireland, off Scotland, and off Ireland. There was a remnant left. Some of them escaped to Holland, and do you know what that bunch that escaped to Holland, and then they went back to Plymouth, and they sailed from Plymouth, and they were the Pilgrim Fathers. Do you remember that? I hope you remember that. I hope you remember the date, too. And they came to Plymouth Rock, and they were the founders of modern America. Who were they? Christians of the woman who were escaping the persecution of the beast. Can you see that? Where was the place that they went to? China? Africa? South America? The United States of America. And then successive waves of them came in. Then, of course, as you know all about William Penn. He came in. I hope you know as much American history as me. Well, I'll tell you one thing a lot of Americans don't know. Do you know that the little state of New Hampshire, no, a, a little state of Rhode Island, was founded and established as a Baptist state? Did you know that? All the people lived in original Rhode Island were Baptists. It's amazing what people don't know, but this is church history. And to this place, with two wings, like an American eagle, this nation, I wonder how many people, I couldn't do it, how many people could quote the words on the Statue of Liberty? You could, brother. You could. You could shout it out for us, can you? Thank you. What other nation on earth does that? Hmm? They're still doing it. Now, honestly, friends, do you honestly think that God would pull the plug on the United States of America and sink them? Do you realize what would happen if a supposed antichrist was to come and sit in the White House? There would be no more money for missions. There would be no more feed to food to f or clothing to feed the hungry and the clo uh, clothe the clothe the naked. There would be no one on a national scale in the world that could do the work of Christ. And the world would disintegrate in total godlessness, which the communists wanted to do. Think again. So let's get back to Malachi. That's a little uh, extra aside. <clears throat> Um, I brought some of my books with me, Where is the Antichrist? But uh, there weren't too many, but Brother or, or Sister Miller can always order some more if you want any. Tells much of the story. Now, in Malachi, we've read the awful thing that God is going to do. Now, we know you we used to be here about, all oh, the Chinese have gone communist. One third of the population of the world are Chinese, and all oh, they're going to be rubbed out. Strange things have happened, haven't they, in recent years? You know, it's the same thing. It took President Nixon to see that, and they kicked him out after Watergate. But he was the first one to go to China and say, we've got to have a rapprochement with China. And that rapprochement has brought them peace, and the door is open. And I prophesy right now in the name of the Lord that in the next few years, the gospel will go back into China more than it ever went back in the past. And when China receives the gospel in a great way, it's going to affect all the other nations round about, including Vietnam and Cambodia. God doesn't want these nations to go down the drain. His judgments are in the earth, yes. He's judged China. He's judged Vietnam. He's judged Cambodia. He's judged Uganda. He's judged a lot of other nations. He's still going to go on judging a lot of nations. What for? In order that my people shall learn righteousness. We're in the beginning of the most glorious restoration of righteousness that you can even begin to imagination. To Im imagine. Or I leave them neither root nor branch, full stop, period. Then we read the other side of the coin. Turn it over. But unto you. But. I once heard somebody say, <coughs> sheep follow, but goats but. And we are in the time of the dividing of the sheep and the goats in the Bible, right? What are you? Are you Balaam? Well, I'll show you something else in the scripture too. I, I got a sense of humor and I see all kinds of funny things all over the Bible. I don't mind preaching to mutton heads, but you listen to what I'm going to preach to in a moment. But unto you that fear my name, that have a holy 
awe, a reverential fear of my name and my word, to spend time in study and in prayer and in ministry unto you. Surely, S-U-N, son, there's actually a legitimate spiritual pun here. Shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings? Two wings we talked about tonight, American wings and Jesus' wings. He's going to arise in our day. <clears throat> in our day. Now, when we read the word healing, don't, even, don't sort of think about a healing campaign and laying hands on the sick. Don't think about that. Think about the fundamental meaning of words. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You say, oh, yes, that's just all about that. No, they don't. They know very little about it. In fact, I doubt yet whether anyone in the world has fully understand, understood the meaning of those words of Jesus. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Because the word saved in the Greek, S-O-Z-O, to Canadian S-O-Z-O, it means to be made whole. He that believeth and is baptized shall be made whole. And you are triune, your first spirit, then your mind, and then your body, which envelopes the mind and the spirit. And you are an, you are an, an unbroken triunity. If your spirit is right with God, your mind will begin taught to be right with God, and your body will follow suit. So the purpose of the, those words of Jesus is that he that believes and is baptized, and don't forget baptism comes after believing, will you? Shall be made whole. Now what does the word whole mean? It comes from an ancient Anglo-Saxon word, Halle, H-A-L-E. And it means, it is translated quite literally, wholeness, holiness, and health. The root of the Anglo-Saxon word Halle gives us health, spiritual, physical, and mental health. Not a half-prepared job, a complete, total job unto old age. Because the Bible says that he will give long life and satisfaction to people who believe and demonstrate unto him his salvation. He'll demonstrate unto us his saving health. That's what it's called in the psalm. Hallelujah. Praise God. Saving health. Don't settle for less. That's what he's doing today. He's getting hold of men and women and teaching them to expect nothing but God's best. We shall mount up as eagles unto you that fear my name. All right. Now, when we've understood this and we're seeking after the Son of Righteousness instead of after all these other things, because, you know, you're not told to ask, ask for food. Well, you are in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Fine. In that sense, you're asked to give him daily bread. And I believe that that, that prayer lasts as long uh, as before Jesus comes. Don't you? Do, you? do you ever think that you won't have his daily bread? I said, did you think you will not have his daily bread? You said, well, I've been told the dollar's going back. Well, the do you can't eat dollars. Well, I've been told my bankroll's going down the drain. Well, that's all right. That's a good place for it. As long as the nose doesn't go down the drain. <laughs> Get our thinking orientated on faith and not bank accounts, will you? Praise the Lord, I mean that. I don't know what's going to happen to the dollar. Nor does anybody else. He just write a book on it. I haven't the faintest idea what's going to happen to the dollar. And frankly, I'm not particularly interested. I've got a few thousand dollars invested, but if they go down the drain, well, hallelujah, I've still got Jesus. He can give me much bigger and better dollars back again. Amen. Now, if we accept this, then we shall go forth and grow up. I like that. Going forth indicates We've got to quit where we are. And that usually means to their denomination. We've got to quit being denominationally minded first. I'm a most undenominational person. There's nothing wrong with belonging to a denomination. So long as the constitution and decrees and the bylaws of your denomination don't take precedence over the word of God. Because the moment you... I was talking to some Catholics one time in Wisconsin and I was telling about some of the things that I've told you and shared with you and one lady was getting visibly upset and she said so. She says, I'm a Catholic and I don't like you to he hear you say those things. 
Well, I said, son, it's not my fault. Martin Luther began it. Blame him. He went forth. I read that scripture in, in Revelation 18 to them. Boy, it's a strong scripture. Come out from among them and, and be ye separate. And you know what it goes on to say? The Lord brought it to my mind while I was meditating down there. And reward unto her double. Hello? Who's that? The church? Boy, I tell you, the church is going to develop and grow up in our generation, and you're going to get such a smack in the eye to all these denominations and all the devil's works and all the devil's Babylonian system financially and ecclesiastically and politically. The church is going to smack the devil right on the nose, and you're going to see a great victory for Jesus. But you're going to do it. And the reason you're going to do it is because Jesus has already done everything that he's going to do. He said, it is finished. Now you go ahead. Here's the ball. Take it. We shall go forth and grow up. And it's about time some of us grew up. Isn't it? You know, the, you know, well, it began in Toronto, but it's spread all over the United States now. If you want to fill a church at Christmas time, do you know what you have to have? Singing Christmas tree or a singing crown. And boy, that packs them in solid. There's a church in Toronto that packs five Sunday services with a singing Christmas tree. And there they build a Christmas tree 60 feet high, wooden branches, and, and, and uh, well, people go out there by ladders with little tiny electric light bulbs, and they hold the electric light bulbs and they sing cows and they pack that church out as they're never able to pack in any other day of the year. Why? Nice, sanctified entertainment. Little babies feeding on pablum. It's right, isn't it? And as I heard one preacher say, spilling it all down their bibs, too. Grow up! Now, here we get the animal part, you sheep. You are supposed to grow up as calves of the stall. Now, what do calves grow into? Bulls and cows. Your, the cow in your case, the bull in your husband's case. And Jesus is called the bull of Bashan. One of the symbols, and there are many, of Jesus. He's the door, and he's the... Uh, so on, but the, one of the symbols of Jesus is a lamb and also a bull. Because he's a lamb when he went like a lamb to the slaughter. And he's a bull when he comes back again with that, those horns and he's going to scatter his enemies to the right and the left. And right now he wants to see a demonstration of the church like John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. And that's what our brother spoke about this morning when he referred, and it's all in Malachi 4, I don't think we can touch it today, about the Elijah ministry. The word Elijah in the Hebrew means Eli, Yah. It means God himself, or my Lord, is Jehovah, God. And so my Lord, who is Jehovah God, or God himself, is going to reappear on the earthly scene in this world, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all nations and all the world, and then shall the end come. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. So Jesus ain't coming tonight. That's right. Now, you know, a lot of people have been sold on that era. Oh, get ready, everyone. Let's have an article. We may not be here tomorrow night, and aircraft are going to come falling down as their pilots go, and trains are going to crash as their engineers go. Rubbish. I say to these people, don't you know what it says in Zechariah? No. It says it'll be a day of neither light nor dark. It'll be twilight all over the world, and that'll be real spooky. You know, I once heard somebody say, I mean, the rubbish you get talk. I once heard somebody say, well, Jesus can't possibly come in clouds over Arizona. I said, why not? He said, because they never have any clouds over Arizona. Well, believe me, I've been in Arizona when there were clouds. That's the way people talk, because it contradicts what somebody has taught them. But it's a day, Zechariah 4, 14 and 4, it is a day that is neither light nor dark, and brother, that's got to be real spooky when you wake up one morning and the sun doesn't begin to come out. Well, Jesus said so, the sun should be darkened, didn't he? And the moon shall not give her light, didn't he? Well, that's when it happens. Just before the coming of Jesus, who then breaks through with his illumination in the clouds of the air. Now, it would be a funny situation if he was going to break through the clouds for them in Arizona and there were, weren't any clouds, boy, they'd miss the bus. You see how ridiculous people get. When I was in Australia, I said to the people, how many of you people believe that you're going to go up when Jesus comes? They all put their hands up and said, you're wrong. 
I said, you're going to go down, I'm going to go up. But we're all going to go into the clouds. We're going to not only grow up, brother, we're going to go up. But are you on the going up scene? Or are you going to sit down and just enjoy singing Christmas trees until Jesus comes? Of course we could substitute singing quartets, couldn't we? I'm not against them, I love them. We could substitute beautiful trained choirs, couldn't we? And I'm for them. But these are simply adjuncts to the Word. It's the Word that matters. So we're going to go into bulls and cows. Well, they're pretty strong creatures. Then what do they do with bulls and cows? When they, show up, they take them out of the stalls and they put them in the field, which is the world. And they go on, eat it up, and so you shall tread down the wicked. Who? Church. What? Me? Tread down? No, that's not my business. That's his business. So it isn't. He's done it. If only people could understand this from the healing deliverance ministry, God has already healed and saved and delivered everybody. It's up to us to enter into it. That's all. So we've got to go forth and tread down the wicked. And they, the wicked, shall be souls under the, shall be self ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. In what day? The day of the Lord when it comes to judge the people. That's the time the church is going to be shining, radiant with the power of God, putting our feet on evil things. Now let me go with you to the words of Jesus and then I want to swing back into Hosea. The words of Jesus found in Luke 10. I'm amazed at some of the things that Dr. Luke wrote. If he, if he wrote these in the medical journals today, they'd throw him out of the medical association. Luke 10 and 19. Now the first 70 ordinary men, ordinary Joes and guys, that Jesus sent out, they were not the clergy. At least we don't know that they didn't contain any of them, but I think it's unlikely. And he sent them out two by two. And do you know why he sent them out two by two? Because every word of God must be established by the mouth of two. That's why, the two. that's why there are two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Every word of God shall be established out of the mouth of two or more witnesses. A husband and wife is a two, two team. An apostle and a prophet is a two team. Uh, a two evangelists going out are a two team. That's how God expects it. And they returned, verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, what's this? Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. Now, the most interesting fact is, how did these 70 ordinary Joes know there were any demons? They couldn't have been members of the Pentecostal churches. <laughs> how did they know? Shall I tell you how they knew? Because they said, we have come to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth to heal your sick and to raise the dead. Come on, people. In Jesus' name. Boom. That's where you get boom, doom, and gloom, but that's the devil. Boom, doom, and gloom. Demons began to fall to the, to the, to the people to the ground and they writhed and they coughed out and they screamed out. I tell you, I've seen everything in this, in this ministry. And they experienced it. Before the cross, honey, before Pentecost, how about that? They were Old Testament believers. Wow. In fact, they were Old Testament Baptists. Then Jesus made a remarkable statement. I hope I'm not hurting anybody because I love you. But I want to get those rid of those corns, right? And he said unto them, but I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. When you began to do these things, man, I saw Satan's power broken. I saw in vision Satan falling as a, an angel from heaven, or the heavenly. And this is what the church is supposed to do in our day. Manifest Jesus and see Satan's powers broken in the heavenly. Because he's the prince of the power of the, of the world, and I despise him right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke the enemy of the devil in Jesus' name. I command him to let America go in Jesus' name, and he's got to obey. I hate him. You say, well, he hates you too, by the way. Yeah, but I hate him double. Reward unto him double. Oh, now, we see about you bulls and you, and you cows, not goats, though. 
Behold, said Jesus, I give unto you power or authority to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All. A-L-L. The power of the devil. Where is he? Under our feet. Under our feet. Under your feet. One for sin, one for sickness. You got it? Don't sit on scorpions, honey. They hurt. And some of us have been sitting down too long. Now we're to get up, go forth, and grow up, and act like men, bulls and cows. And nothing, and nothing, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But they hadn't even been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But they were so, though. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And mind you, if a promise is made in the Old Testament, it's still with us in the New. Do you believe that? Amen. One evening I'm going to speak on obeying God, and that's going to be a dynamic message. It's going to even tell you some of the foods that you shouldn't eat. Amen. Amen. So you'll be right here on target, and I don't know quite what day I'm going to do this, because I'm leading up from the, from the particular to the specific. That's a specific, but it's a very important specific, because of that scripture that our brother brought out this morning when he said that uh, Jesus Christ learned obedience through suffering and he said that he's come uh, to prepare people like us who will also uh, be obedient. That's in, uh, in Hebrews 5, but I just forget the exact wording, but we're, we're going to bring that out another night. Now let's look at Deuteronomy 20, 28, which deals with the, again, it's a contrast chapter. The first uh, 14 verses are given to the positive side. And all the rest of it are given to the negative side. Listen to the negative. And the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with the extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. The Lord will smite you with the botch of Egypt, and the emeralds, and with the scab, and with itch whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. Who? Believers. Israelites. You mean... God will do that? Yes, you don't say it. You know, you can say, I don't believe in the law of gravity. I stick my tongue out the law of gravity. I'm going to prove him wrong. I don't care whether God made the law of gravity or not. I don't understand how gravity operates anyway, so I'm just going to prove it. I'm going to jump off a tall building and do this. And someone will take the funeral service. That's judgment for stupidity. And disobeying God is stupidity. Right. For the Bible says it's better to obey than sacrifice. And you will be the sacrificial lamb instead of Jesus. He died for you. He didn't ask you to die all by yourself. Anyway, that's not a myth. In the positive side now, verse 13, just one verse. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If, if, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to do and to, ob to observe and to do them. I like that. We shall be at the head. We are in Christ. Right? And he is in us. If, if only you could just get that message. That's another message from Ephesians, but just touching it. We are in Christ. And Christ is in us. Where Christ is, where is Christ? The right hand of the Father in heaven. Okay. We are, therefore, in Christ on the right hand of the Father in heaven. Can you see that? Is that too much for you? And he is where he, we are because he is in us. We are in him and he is in us. That's what I call a mutual juxtaposition. And so our feet on earth are his feet. And we are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all principalities and powers and every name that is named. Glory to God, we're on top. We're above. Hallelujah. And God gives us feet to walk on this earth until one day a couple of angels have come down and say, Come on, Brother Maxwell, you've been here long enough. Come up, brother, whoosh, into the clouds of the earth. How do you think I'm going to get there? You know, you don't know, don't know how many guardian angels I got. Brother, I got a gang. That's right. You know, every time I go out in my automobile on these roads today where people drive like crazy, I say, Now, Lord, I cover my car in the blood and I invite the angels of God to have charge over me while I drive and keep me in all my ways. And brother, I've got news for you. They've never failed me yet. 
But he's in danger of the floor. We never use them. I think when Wally really brings them into his ministry, we never use them. Glory to God. But we've got a bunch of angels. Now let me tell you something, and you won't forget some of these little things that I say here, and I'm enjoying myself, and I know you are too. <laughs> you know the, the size of an average sidewalk? It's about the size of this platform. Now on this platform, you put five people, see, in a row, shoulder to shoulder, and if you walk down as a solid phalanx, five of you, then anyone coming in the opposite direction have to get off in the gutter. Now, there are five of you. I said, there are five of you. As far as you and your husband are concerned, that makes ten. You say, well, who are they? Well, it's you. I know you're important because you looked in the mirror this morning. They don't tell me you didn't. What did you see? Best you could offer Jesus, didn't you? Now, don't grumble about what you got. It's the only thing you'll ever get. Just give it to him. Forget it. Get on with the Lord's job. Well, I do. I get greatly comforted. <laughs> I say, good morning, Jesus. <laughs> so, who are the others? Well, do you know, this is the amazing truth. We've got two feet, right? At least most of them have got two feet. We're born with two feet. And inside this mortal body, which carried on two feet, there's the Heavenly Father, the Son of God, and the Holy Ghost. That's right. They are literally in me from here to the base of my feet, and every time I walk along, my feet, listen, are carrying the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And they're, they're carrying. If I go into a house, I can say, Shalom. Because I'm bringing in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And when I sit down to have a meal, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost sit down in me to have a meal. You say, well, who's the fifth? One guardian angel. There may be many others. But one guardian angel in the Old Testament slew 185,000. So what are you afraid of? You say, well, never mind Father, never mind Son, never mind Holy Ghost. Let the angel do it. Come on, praise the Lord. If you can see it that way, you are invincible. Who is he that can harm you if you do that which is good? Nobody, nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. You say, why do I get hurt? Because you're so dumb. You see, a lot of this faith teaching is going around saying you'll never get hurt. So that ain't true. Because if you didn't know the negative, you wouldn't appreciate the positive. I heard somebody say the other day <coughs> that had Paul, the great apostle Paul, the chiefest of all the apostles, known what he was doing, he would have rebuked the spirit that came upon him to give him repeated buffetings, and he would have passed it away from him and had no more trouble. Well, the Bible says when Paul was filled with the Spirit, Ananias prophesied and said, Brother Paul, you are called to much suffering for the cause of Christ. And I submit that if Paul was called by much suffering to reveal Christ, and I'm going to try and get a shortcut, it's not going to work, and we're going to be very disappointed. I had a lady come to me in Florida last winter, and she'd been caught up in one of these uh, 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 ultra faith teachings. Now, I'm, I'm in agreement with what they teach, providing they present the negative side too, which they don't. And she said, I am very distressed, by the way. She said, I'm losing a bit of my hearing. And she said, I've been told I shouldn't have suffer like that. I've been told I should have full hearing. So then I, I said a very nasty thing to a lady. I said, honey, what about the wrinkles? She said, what do you mean? But I said, you're not only slightly deaf, but you've got wrinkles. You're 76 years of age, and I've got news for you. You're doing marvelously in Christ. And she thanked my wife and I, and she said, you've taken a burden off me. I had been in extreme condemnation because of the teaching that I had been getting, that I should never have any sickness or weakness. It's wrong. You're going to learn victory through suffering. You're going to learn health to attack to the devil. And the devil is going to attack you, every one of us. And if he hasn't attacked you yet, up to your 39 years of age, you're going to get it on your 40th anniversary. What are you going to do when he attacks? Say, I blow it. No, you haven't. You just learned there was a weakness in the armor there. It was just learned that there was something in your life that wasn't fully sanctified yet. You're learning. You're being conformed to the image of the Son of God. You're learning obedience through suffering. 
And one of these days you're going to meet him who suffers for you and say, good morning, Jesus. There's nothing wrong with me now. I've got my resurrection body and there ain't no wrinkles and bald patches in that. In the meantime, it's all fun. Above only. Above only. I like that little word only and not beneath. Why? Because it's the devil who's beneath. Sin and sickness and suffering and stupidity and sorrow and all these other things that make up the civil and of Satan the serpent. But Jesus got the bunch. And he put them on the top of the cross. And he put a big S up there. And it wasn't a dollar sign. He said, that means salvation. I've taken care of all the other S's. All right, one final scripture. We're going to Hosea. <coughs> now, I often cause myself grave embarrassment when... Oh, no, I've got it. I've got it. I take the marker out and then I lose my place. I've got it. Hosea 6. Would you please turn to Hosea, which comes right after Daniel won't have too much trouble, and right before Joel, which you'll never find, and right before Amos, which you'll never find, and Hosea chapter 6. Most interesting scripture to close this little dissertation off with this afternoon, and I will be glad to pray for a limited number, but, uh, you know, I prefer, if you've got real faith to receive your miracle, okay, but I'm going to preach on the working of miracles. And that'll be a day when faith will begin to arise, and, and you can take your healing or your miracle or whatever, and you can take it right there. Now, Hosea chapter 6, or the last verse of chapter 5, which really belongs to chapter 6. And here's the negative, again, preceding the positive. Always you get that teaching. The negative preceding the positive. Verse 15 of chapter 5, I will go, said God, and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, in their affliction, in their affliction, they will seek me early. Okay? How did you come to Christ? By affliction? I did. That's another story. Then we get the three marvelous verses that have a prophetic content. And so the cry goes up in due course after God, having returned to his place, just listen and wait and wait until people cry unto him. When my, my people will humble themselves, if my people will cry, then will I heal their land. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. His face taking over, see. They're there with their, their tearings, like the lion and bear tearings. They're there with their ill health, without modern hospital, hospitals, without modern sanitation, without, without modern, um, modern anesthetics, without any of these things. Men and women dying at 30 and 35 years of age for sickness. Quite contrary to the will of God. You know that. Don't despise medical profession. Don't despise drugs. Don't despise all Robert's, unit, all, all Robert's medical facilities. He's had, I think no man's had more battle in putting that thing up than any man alive, but he'll do it. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. This begins revival. See, this begins restoration. Then when restoration begins to take place, then shall we know, and what's this going forth, if we follow on to know the Lord. No sitting down, a getting up, a going forward, and inquiring after God, and keeping in the move of God. That means not denominational in mind. That means come out from them, among them, shall be ye separate. Then shall we know. We come to a day of understanding. If we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, this is rising with the sun of righteousness arising in the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain and the ladder and the former rain unto the earth. Now we are in the time of ladder rain, you know that. You've all been taught that. The outpouring of the Spirit, the return of speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit and healing and deliverance, all these things are with us. All we've got to do is to handle them and see they develop and see they grow. Now what's the, what's the dating here? The people that Hosea prophesied to were the northern house of Israel. And the northern house of Israel went into successive captivities between the years 740 to 720 B.C. You can put this in the margin of your Bible if you like. Between 740 and 720 B.C., under King Sennacherib of the Assyrians, northern house of Israel went into total captivity. God wiped out the most of his Israel people of ten tribes and gave them a bill, of, a bill of divorcement and said, from henceforth, you won't know my name, you won't know my law, you won't know nothing, excepting violence, war. 
trouble, sickness, and everything like that. Now, reckoning some of the people, how do you know whether it's one day or a thousand years for a day or a year for a day? Well, I said, you have to apply it to the context and ask the mind of the Lord on this. This happens to be a thousand year day. One day to a thousand years in this prophecy. And if you project two thousand years, because it says uh, after two days he will revive us, so you have to get the two thousand years, project those, and you get down to the year... Uh, 1260 to 1280 Anno Domini. Now, at this time, the first stirrings of restoration took place. If you read your history, have you heard of Savonarola? Sa have you heard of Savonarola? Okay. Savonarola, a, 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 a priest in the city of Florence, in Italy, began to realize that the Roman Catholic system was totally corrupt. I mean totally. And so he began a reformation. And he got armies behind him. And he marched into the city of Florence, or Firenze. And he took it over. And from uh, his place in Florence, Italy, he was going to move out and wipe the Vatican out and take over Italy for righteousness. But they got hold of that guy and they burnt him at the stake. Now that was the very first stirring. Now watch what it says here. After two days. So from the year 1260 through to where we are today, we've seen progressive outpourings of the Spirit. The next one that was to happen was a man called Jan Hus in Bohemia. And his statue is still in the center of Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia today. And Jan Hus tried to begin a pre-reformation. -re -pre but they got hold of that guy with a fellow called Jeremy, or Jerome, and they took him to, Flo to Constance, on Lake Constance in Italy, and they burnt him at the stake. You see, this was always the tactic of this monstrous system, that God was on the moving side, and people were praying. 1517, 1517, Martin Luther arose, and he got away with it. You know, for three and a half years, Martin Luther... That Christ had to hide in the tomb. He went to the uh, castle in Wurzburg in eastern Germany and hid there because the enemies were out to get him, so he hid away there. And he married a nun in the end. Good for him. Well, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses or points of doctrine to his church in Wittenberg in East Germany. And he said, the Pope teaches 95 errors which do not agree with the word of God. So he was summoned to go to Rome. Well, first of all, he wrote to the Pope and he said, Thou art the Antichrist. And the Pope didn't like that one little bit. So he summoned him for Rome. And he got to Rome and while he was going up these stairs, where you have to go up on your knees to do penance, he was going up on his knees to do penance and he got halfway up and the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, The just shall live by faith. He ran all the way down. He wasn't going to have any more to do with that penance stuff. He got the message, The just shall live by faith. He went back to Germany. He was excommunicated. That means he was sent to hell and he's been in hell ever since according to the Catholics. I should be glad to shake hands with him in heaven one day. And I put it this way to show you the absurdities of these things which were believed for a period of 1260 long years of the dark ages the great falling away of the church prophesied by Paul in Thessalonians. There's not going to be another great falling away, brother. It's already happened. There's only restoration now from now on in. Amen. Get it straight. If I've done nothing else to get rid of some of these old things out of your mind, I've done a good job. And then from there on, 1517, Martin Luther, until 1735, that's a long period of time of over 200 years, you had the Reformation churches, and the book of Revelation, it says you have a name that you're dead. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. And that's where the Reformation churches, many of them are today, stone dead. Ice boxes, graveyards, carrying the names of Luther and Wesley and who were on fire for God. You know that's true. I'm not being rude. And then John Wesley arose. Now, John Wesley was baptized in the Holy Spirit. John Wesley, on his last occasion, went to a Church of England building in London, and they slammed the door in his face and said, we are not having you preach here. And it was the Church of England minister. So they excommunicated him. Same old story, you see. So John Wesley wasn't discouraged. He thought himself, did you say a Cadillac? Hmm. No, a donkey. And on this donkey, which required no gas but only hay, hey, hey, 
He drove through the streets of England preaching the gospel, and historians tell us that he saved England from the French Revolution. One man under God. 1735 to 1785. God gave him 50 years of ministry, and he ministered right up to the last week. And he brought in holiness under the law. 1785 into the 19th century saw the great American awakening. John Whitfield, Moody, and others began about 1845, I think. The great American evangelical awakening which made America what she is today. And then, the very beginning of this century in Topeka, Kansas, there was a little group in a Bible school there under Dr. Charles Parham, the Mary's daughter, and Dr. Charles Parham was being moved upon by the Spirit of God, remember, 1901, January. Search the Scriptures, he said, and find out whether there's any evidence expected when you receive the baptism of the Spirit. Because all the holiness people, which includes the Nazarenes and the Christian Missionary Alliance and the, Bat and the, and the Methodists, the Free Methodists, they all believe that sanctification was a separate experience. Now he said, search the scriptures and see whether we're right. Now that was a brave thing to do. That was a way to lose all your customers. So they searched the scriptures and one lady, young lady, about 18 years of age, while they were praying, well, first of all they searched the scriptures, they collated all the scriptures for and they collated all the scriptures against and when he came back, he said, well, what have you found? They said, invariably, it seems that those who received the baptism of the Spirit spoke in other languages as the Spirit gave the mushrooms, 1901. And uh, they began to pray. He said, okay, pray and get it. So they did. And one year girl was Agnes, I've forgotten her other name. All of a sudden, at age 18 years of age, they say her face lit up like the sun, and she began to speak forth in other tongues as the Spirit gave her utterance. And then the whole Bible school within the next week received the same experience. And that's the first recorded experience of the baptism of the Spirit in, in recent time. And it happened in Los Angeles, uh, correction, it happened in Kansas, uh, in the United States of America. And began, began the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You people are a very blessed people. Then it was taken down to San Antonio, Texas. Then it was taken by a colored brother called Seymour to Los Angeles, California. to some more colored uh, people there, and they kicked him out. They went, to the, they went to found some other people, and they listened to him. And that began the Azusa Street Mission, uh, the Apostolic Faith Mission in Azusa Street, California, in 1906. People came from all over the world to receive the baptism of the Spirit there. And that began what we're now in the ending of. Well, no, you shouldn't end the sentence with a preposition, but I've done it anyhow. We are now in the ending of this that happened on the day of Pentecost. Listen, friends. Brother Miller, I am not too sure that I appreciate this expression, a prayer language. It is a prayer language. It's all of that, but it's much more. And if I get time this week, and I think I will, I want to tell you what the baptism of the Spirit really is and really does and really equips you with. It's tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. You have not received the baptism of the Spirit until you have exploded in tongues. And that's the beginning. And I can show you in the Bible, in Ephesians 1 and 11, it's called the down payment of your inheritance. Hallelujah. I've had the down payment. Now I'm pressing in to become so wealthy and so healthy and so beautiful. Anyway, my feet are that the world will look at me and say, it's worth becoming a Christian. Hallelujah. And that goes for all of us. You will not lack any good thing. Well, so they haven't got any dollars. So what? The Bible says you'll lack no good thing. Put away this fear of the future. Forget it. It's sin. And prepare for the biggest clean-up job that you've ever had in your life. And some of you need it, if you're honest. Mm-hmm. Hebrews 6, it says, that let us go on unto perfection or maturity. And that's where we're going. Praise God. We're leaving behind the principles of the first doctrine of Christ. Or the doctrine of Christ, the first principle. And we're going on now into maturity. See that we go on. Not quite certain what I'll preach about tomorrow, but I'll seek the Lord. And I've laid a preparation. And does anyone want to be prayed for right now? I'd prefer out you wait, but if you cannot be here for a day or two, I'll be glad to pray for you. But remember... It isn't repeated prayers that does the trick. It's faith in God, preceded by obedience. 
Okay, if somebody wanted to say, so if you come forward, I'll lay hands on you, I'll rebuke the devil, I'll claim the healing that belongs to you, and you take it. You take it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come against the foul hunting spirit. This woman needs a clean-up job. This woman needs the blood of Jesus Christ, the size of every part of her mind and her body. I come against the unclean spirit in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, and I bind you, I rebuke you, I command you to be bound, and I command you now, loose and come out of her. In the name of Jesus, come out. Praise the Lord. Hold on. Take a deep breath. Read it out. Read it out. In the name of Jesus, the Son of God, come out of her. Did you hear me say? You're thinking the same, come out. Come out. Go. In the name of Jesus, go. Go. Come on, let it go. Come on, let it go. In Jesus' name, that's it. Come on, out of it. Come out. Come out. Come out. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, thing. I rebuke you, thing. Oh, hallelujah. I rebuke you, thing. I rebuke you, thing. Come out of it. Come out of it. Come out of it. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.